Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dearman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we go. Matthew chapter 5 from the New King James Version. And here's what it says. And seeing the multitudes, so there were, I mean, thousands of people gathered around. And seeing the multitudes, not just a multitude, but multitudes. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And boy, this is, we believe, the Mount of Beatitudes is just up from Capernaum. I've been there many times. It's absolutely a beautiful, spectacular view over the, looking over the Sea of Galilee. And it says, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, and this is typical for a teacher, they would sit down. When he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, and here we go, this is the Sermon on the Mount. And it starts with the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So let me give you the angle that Jesus is coming from here. Jesus is coming to Jewish people, certainly, but these are not just Jewish, Jewish people at any point in history, like maybe under the heyday of Solomon. No, this is a Jewish people that is under the tyranny of the Roman government. They are taxed very heavily. They are quite poor. And they don't have their own freedom. They don't rule their own nation, so to speak. And so life is honestly not all that good. And so Jesus is coming and speaking some words. He's going to speak some very pointed, profound truth. He's going to, he's going to clarify and correct some doctrinal beliefs that people have, some false beliefs that people have. But he starts off with some very encouraging beatitudes about people who uh, seem at, at a disadvantage, but God's going to turn their disadvantage around to be an, an advantage. And so blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That doesn't just mean blessed are people that are sad, but blessed, blessed are people who instead of just living a life of partying and saying, eat, drink, and uh, be merry for tomorrow we die. No, but they're still living in obedience to God. They're still living with an awareness of the kingdom of God. Even under the oppression of the Romans and this difficult life, they're still trying to serve God. And so their, their hope is faint because things just don't look so good right now. But Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He's saying it may not be all that good now, but let me tell you, because of your faith and because of the covenant that you have and being loyal to that covenant, the kingdom of heaven belongs to you. You'll soon enjoy and inherit the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Jesus is saying it's not always going to be like that. If you're mourning now by living as uh, one of the people of God, one of the people of the book, as Jews were called, because they had the Bible, then he said, you shall be comforted. Your day is coming, and it's a good day. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The meek doesn't mean weak. The meek is controlled strength. You're, you're holding back. You're using self-control. You're not saying everything you could say. You're not doing everything you could do. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. This is a prerequisite for being filled with spiritual things, is to have a hunger and a thirst. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Remember that next time you're tempted to be too harsh and to not show mercy. Remember it says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Boy, that's incentivizing. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God and daughters of God as well. Boy, I want that. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Not all persecution is for righteousness' sake. You may be persecuted because you gave somebody a dirty look or you said something to them you should not have said. Well, that's not for righteousness' sake. That's your own fault for getting in the flesh. But 
there are people who are persecuted because they're doing the right thing. And that happens even in uh, countries that don't have religious persecution to speak of. Like, for example, just you not being willing to participate in drugs or alcohol or certain perverse conversation or looking at pornography and such. Sometimes people will persecute you, ridicule you. What are you, a goody two-shoes? What are you, holier than thou? And they'll persecute you because you're doing the right thing. And he said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Watch this. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So Jesus is turning things around and saying, oh, they may be giving you a very hard time and persecuting you, but he said, when they're doing this against you and it's false, he said falsely, when they're doing it against you uh, falsely, in other words, now if you deserve it, if you really did the wrong that they're ridiculing you about, well, that's different. But if they're doing this and you really didn't do anything wrong, he said rejoice and be exceedingly glad. He said your reward in heaven is going to be an amazing. Okay, and then verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it, we, how shall it be seasoned? So he's telling them, you may think you're not respected. You may think that you're not esteemed or you're esteemed very lowly. He said, but you don't realize that even you being there, even you having your perspective is flavoring people. People are aware of the kingdom ways, the kingdom way of thinking because you're there and because you have and voice your perspective, even if in a very respectful way. So it says, if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? Or how shall the earth be seasoned? Uh, it is then good for nothing. If salt it doesn't flavor anything, if we, our Christian lives, don't flavor anybody, then what are we good for? Why are we even here on the earth? It is good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. And so that's what we are. Jesus said, we're the light of the world. And then he says in verse 16, I really love this verse, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So people need to see our good works. People need to see uh, the light that's coming out of us. And he said, let your light so shine. Now, he's not talking about going around condemning people or trying to shame people for being sinful or unrighteous. No, he's saying, but let your light shine. Let your light so shine that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. A lot of people think that Jesus came and abolished the Old Testament. He didn't abolish it. He fulfilled it. <laughs> he fulfilled the Old Covenant. Verse 18, For assuredly I say to you that till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. So Jesus just told us right there that the Old Testament law has not yet been fulfilled, had not been, yet been fulfilled. And I can tell you this today, it still has not been fulfilled. God has promised the Jews some things at the end of the age, even Isaiah chapter 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you. That specifically was promised to the Jewish people that this is the way that it's going to be at the end of the age. And so he, Jesus said, not one jot, not one tittle, not one dotted I, not one crossed T will pass away from the law till every word, every syllable, every letter of it comes to pass. That's how powerful the word of God is. Verse 19, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he should be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So people that are doers of the word and teachers of the word so that they influence other people to be doers of the word, Jesus said they'll be called great. But people who don't obey the word of God and even teach other people or condone other people's actions of not obeying the word, Jesus said they'll be called least. So he's talking about believers 
believers, but he's saying, but you'll be the least of the believers because you broke the law, you broke the commandments, and you even taught people it was okay to break the commandments. You'll be the least. And so, verse 20, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Oh, this is bold. He tells them, look, your leaders, the scribes, the ones who write the scripture, and the Pharisees, the ones who teach the scripture, if your righteousness is not better than theirs, you won't even go to heaven. You'll go to hell. Why? Because they're depending on their own righteousness, which is far subpar, not anywhere near adequate. And they're not depending on the grace of God and walking in faith. Verse 20, you have heard that it was said, and I love this, how Jesus will begin to teach you. You heard this, but this is the reality. Watch this. You have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not murder. Well, of course, that's one of the Ten Commandments. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Wow, Jesus said, it's not just if you follow through and murder, but what about in your heart if you're angry, but there's no cause? You're just letting yourself get in the flesh and be angry at another brother or sister? Jesus said, you're in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. That, that's speaking slanderously, putting somebody down speaking to them as if they're bad or dumb or stupid. Raka shall be in danger of the council, but whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. So there are levels here of sinfulness when it comes to how we treat other people. And Jesus said, be careful because that kind of lifestyle of lo lo a loose tongue, speaking your mind, being critical of people, Jesus said, oh man, you, you could talk your way right out of salvation with your disobedience, your harshness, that evil speaking. Somebody said, I thought we weren't saved by works, but by grace we are. But you're saved by grace, but now you're supposed to live and walk in the grace of God and not walk in disobedience. Because if you walk in disobedience, that is not proof that you're saved. That's proof that you're not. And Jesus said, you cannot speak like this to other brothers. Oh, brothers and sisters, people are too loose with their tongues these days. And they just say anything they want to and just become arrogant and become critical. And Jesus is saying, you better not do that. That's not appropriate. That's not right. Verse 23, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. This scripture actually comes to my mind a lot because like you, you may come to church and you come to worship God and such, but you remember, oh man, there's a brother or sister in the Lord, maybe even a family member that you're offended with and uh, angry, or really the way that this reads, it's not so much you having something against them. Listen again. He says in verse 23, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you. So this is not you having something against them. This is them having something against you. What does he say? Leave your gift. Stop offering your gift. Stop. We would, I would say in this illustration, stop worshiping God. And, and go and get reconciled with your brother. He said, first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. What does that mean? When you come before the Lord, you're coming having washed yourself, having cleansed yourself, having gotten everything right. Why? Because you're coming before a holy God. That's why. You're coming before a holy God. And we ought to make sure that we're reverencing him and realizing you can't just walk in there casually like he's just a friend down the street. This is the creator of heaven and earth. And if there's something out of alignment in your life or your relationships, he's expecting that you'll do everything you can to get that rectified before you come in and start trying to serve him with that filthiness in your life, with something unreconciled, something that you could do, but you're not doing it. See, and so this is just a comfort to God. This is what brings God pleasure. This is what is not an irritant to God that we would actually try to live the way he wants us to. Verse 25 goes along with it. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. Jesus said, resolve problems right away. 
Don't let them fester until they cause bigger problems. Verse 27, you have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not commit adultery. That's one of the Ten Commandments. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So Jesus is saying it's not just following through with the act of adultery, but did you do it in your heart? If you did it in your heart, then you, you already really compromised. And that doesn't mean go ahead and do it. Absolutely not. But, because that's sexual immorality if you follow through with that. But he's saying, but the adultery of compromising, you already made that decision to go there in your heart. Oh, you went there. That's what Jesus is saying. You already went there in your heart. And he goes on to say, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. What is he talking about? Looking at women, men, looking at pornography, looking at something with your eye. If your right eye is the problem, pluck it out and cast it from you. Now, Jesus is not literally saying to pluck your eye out. Because if you pluck one eye out, your other eye would be tempted to look at pornography or look at some other person with lust. No, but he's saying, take care of the sin. Get rid of the opportunity. Cut off the occasion. Stay away from that person. Do something drastic to get that out of your life. And so he goes on to say, it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Jesus is letting us know, unconfronted sin unchecked sin left going in our lives. We're choosing to continue to walk in that sin. Therefore, we're choosing for Jesus not to be our master and Lord. We're choosing to serve our flesh. And he said, it's better that you take care of that and do whatever you got to do to be free than to be cast into hell. To hell. And he said, if your right hand causes you to sin, very interesting, he starts with the eye, then he goes to the hand. Because I, I believe with all of my heart that this would imply, or at least uh, directly apply, to looking at pornography and masturbation. He said, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your right hand offends you, then cut it off. He said, cut it off and cast it from you because it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. So Jesus is very pointed about this stuff that we need to control ourselves and not only our bodies, but our hearts and cut off the occasion, cut off the internet, lock up your phone with passwords and give somebody else the password. Do whatever you have to do. There are things you can do. God will lead you to cut off those things. I, those things I remember long before the internet when I was bound with lust, God had to teach me how to do these things. But thank God I did them and got free over it. All right, verse 31. Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. In other words, they were casual about this. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. So why does it say except sexual immorality? Well, if, if you're, say you're a man and your wife had committed sexual immorality, He's saying, if you divorce her and then you're causing her to commit sexual immorality, you're causing her to commit adultery is actually what he said. He said, notice again, but I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. Not causes her to commit sexual immorality, but causes her to commit adultery. In other words, say a person's, a man's wife committed uh, sexual immorality. Well, that's adultery, right? And so this man decides he's going to divorce her. Well, but she still wants to be married, but he won't be with her. So for her to be married, she has to commit adultery. She has to break the lifelong vow to make a vow to somebody else. But she made a lifelong vow to the first one. And so Jesus said, you're causing her to commit adultery. But he said, except for sexual immorality. Why? Because if she had been sexually immoral, the husband didn't cause her to commit adultery. She had already committed adultery. Can you see that? And so notice this. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Why is that? Because that woman made a lifelong vow, and by you marrying her, then there's a vow that's being broken. In other words, Jesus is not saying here, nobody can ever remarry. That's not what he's saying. He's just saying, you need to take that covenant serious. It is real. You can't just decide, I'm out, I'm going to something else. You can't. This, a, covenant, a lifelong covenant is a covenant. And God makes the two one. Notice again, or notice going on here in verse 33. Again, you have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not swear falsely, 
but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. What king? Well, the king is actually Jesus, who is to come. The king Jesus is going to come and rule there. Verse 36. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no, no, for whatever is more than that is of the evil one. Jesus is encouraging us not to go into, I promise, I swear, I swear to God, and all that stuff. He's encouraging us, just when you say yes, make sure it it means yes, and you do it. If you say no, make sure it means no, and you do it. Verse 38, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile with him, uh, give him, uh, go with him too. And then verse 2, give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. See, the law, the Old Testament law said an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And when somebody did something wrong, like they knocked somebody's tooth out, then the law says, well, then knock that guy's tooth out because uh, a tooth for a tooth. If somebody, you know, plucks somebody's eye out, well, good, plug that guy's eye out. And the law was uh, helping people understand this principle. God wasn't really trying to say pluck people's eyes out and knock people's tooth out. What he was really trying to say is, When you're administering justice, when you're sentencing people, don't sentence people lighter than their actions, but don't sentence people more harshly than their actions. If somebody got mad and punched a guy and knocked out his tooth, don't cut his head off because that's not the same level. So God was giving people uh, a, a way to think about an appropriate punishment for crimes, for crimes that were committed. And he goes on to say, you've heard that said, and that is true. These are all from the Old Testament scripture. But Jesus is saying in the New Testament, do it differently. If somebody slaps you on one cheek, offer them your your other cheek. If someone asks you to go a mile with them to help them carry their load, it's not your load, it's their load, he said, go too. What is he doing? He's telling them, be like God. Be like God. God doesn't treat us fairly. Thank God. He treats us with grace. He treats us with mercy. He treats us with kindness. We don't deserve his love. So Jesus is teaching them, yeah, that is the law, and that is righteous and appropriate. However, go beyond that and be like God. Be like the kingdom of God and treat people with extra grace and extra dignity and love. See, it's such beautiful words. And uh, and Jesus brought this heart and he modeled it. Look at now verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you and do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. What is he saying? The Father does this. Pray for those who treat you horribly. Pray for them. Treat them with kindness. For God, he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. He's saying your father is much, much more kind to people than they are to him. And verse 46, for if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Therefore, you shall be, therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So he's saying, don't just do what's good for you like everybody else. Go the extra mile and be extra kind to people. Why? Because that's the way your Father in heaven is. And aren't you glad? Oh, I'm so glad he's that way with me. And I really want to be that way with other people. I haven't always been and you haven't either. But let's try to be like, God wants us to be gracious and kind with other people. Thank you again for watching today. If you haven't already done it, click the like button and share this video with others to help them get into God's word. Also, we'd love to partner with you to advance the kingdom of God. To find out more about our BFAM strategy, our ministry school, the BFAM Training Center, other great teaching resources, or to launch a house church, visit solidlives.com. Thank you again, and I'll see you tomorrow.